crossing to the other side. Want to welcome those that are here today for the very first time or every weekend. We're so glad that you're here. Want to welcome those that are watching online as well. Thank you so much for tuning in and being part of this experience. So today my title is this, Crossing Over. How do you get from the side you're on to the side that God wants you to be? And so we're going to talk about transitions, transitions from one level to the next, from one season to the next, from where God is taking us to really where he's destined us to be. And so we're going to be in Joshua. So if you have your Bible, uh, Joshua chapter 3, we're going to be there. And this is a key transition in Scripture. Right now we're reading through the Bible, the Immersed Bible Experience, and we're reading through the beginnings, the first five books of the Bible together. And so you know that God's people are on the move. They, they experienced already, before you get to Joshua, one of the first major transitions, and that was when God raised up Moses to deliver the people out of Egypt, and they were intended to go to the land that God had promised them. But when they stepped out and they crossed over, they actually disobeyed God. They didn't transition well, and that decision cost them 39 years in the wilderness. So how many of you want to pay attention today so you don't make a right or a left-hand turn that costs you 39 years of wilderness experience? So I'd lean in. I might even write a few things down. I might even go back and watch this podcast again so that I don't miss something that costs me a lot of time going in circles. Because that's how a lot of people are living life. They're just going in circles. They're, they're not getting anywhere, but they're moving, and they're doing a lot of activity, but nothing's happening. And so I don't want that to happen in my life, and I definitely don't want it for our church. And so how do we do that successfully? And so they've experienced now uh, a first transition that didn't go well. Now they're making another transition, like a major leadership transition, because Moses now dies with that generation in the wilderness. He's not the one that actually leads them into the promise that God had for them. So now in Joshua, Joshua has been Moses' assistant. So God says, Joshua, this is your time. This is your season. You're now going to raise up, and you're going to lead the people across the Jordan to the land that I intended them to be in. And so now they've just experienced a major leadership change. And so you can imagine what that's like when you're following a leader. We go through it all the time in our country here, so we're used to it. When we're changing presidents and governments and all of that, it, it always takes a while to adjust to a new leader and for people to kind of understand that leader and understand their vision and where they're going. So now the people have experienced that, but now... Joshua comes on the scene and God says, okay, Joshua, we're ready now. We're ready to cross over. You're actually going to do this, and I'm going to use you. So he's about ready to cross over there. I've, I have found in life, I don't know if you have just thought of this, but life is all about transitions. Life is every single day, you and I are in a place of transition. Something's transitioning. Like today, we're going to go from daytime to nighttime. We're going to make that transition. It, and every day you can go from rain to sun. Come on, somebody. The sun's out today. Yeah, so you know that's a big transition. You can go from summer to fall. Like, that's going to happen. So, like, God just designed the universe to where it's never static. It's always transitioning to something else. And, and I have found, just through personal experience, that some transitions are anticlimactic. Anybody ever experienced an anticlimactic transition, like where the expectation and the anticipation was actually bigger than the experience? And like, then you transition, you're like, that's it? That, what did I get all excited? I remember when I was a kid, I think I was somewhere seven, eight, kind of in that range, where my parents said that we were going to be able to stay up and watch it change from one year to the next year. Like, I never knew what New Year's Eve was and, and how really cool it was supposed to be. So, so we were, like, overdosed on sugar. Mom let us have sugar to, so that we could make it till midnight. And midnight was getting closer. I'm thinking, this is going to be so cool. I don't know what's going to happen. I thought, like, the calendar on the refrigerator was going to automatically flip 
or something. I just didn't know what was happening. I was like, oh, so, so it's getting close to midnight. My parents are passed out on the couch, and all of his kids are running the house. And we're watching television, and back then, the ball in New York City, it, it didn't go down. It actually went up, all right? How many of you up people are out there? You know, it started down, and then it would go up, and then when it hit the top, they'd have fireworks and, you know, all this stuff. So I'm waiting. I'm watching this ball go up. I'm so excited. I'm like, this could be cool. And then it gets up at the top, and boom, fireworks go off. Next thing I know, everybody's blowing those kazoos. And you know those things that you blow and the paper comes out, like pokes your eye out? And, you're, and so we're just blowing those things. And I'm watching television, and everybody's just kissing and making out with someone. And I'm like looking around the room, and it's like my brothers and my two sisters. I'm like, that's not going to happen. And then all of a sudden, mom and dad jump up off the couch. They're like, happy new year. Go to bed now. And I'm like laying in bed going, this is what people stay up for? This is stupid. It was so anticlimactic in that moment. I thought, you know what? There's some transitions like that, isn't there? Like, there's a lot of strategic transitions happening right now. Like, this is the season, students, where you're transitioning, like, from elementary to junior high and from junior high to high school and from high school to college. I know right now, this is wedding season, so some of you are transitioning from being single, having money, time, all of that stuff, to being married. And, and some of you are married, you've been married, and now you're transitioning to kids. And, and you're now realizing that there's a whole different season that you're going in. Some of you, you're married with kids, and you're transitioning to free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we're free at last. And so another transition there. Maybe you're transitioning from one job to another job, or you're life is all about transitions. But there are a lot of times people don't transition well. I think there are some people that are just not built to transition well. Like they do not like stepping into the unknown. They don't like stepping into something that's uncertain. They, they get wigged out. They get anxious, restless. Uh, they, just, they just don't transition well. There's others that really do transition well. Like, they just love change. They, they love being able to have that entrepreneur spirit where they're like, I'm just going to walk out into something I've never been before, and I just can't wait for it. But not everybody does that. And so how do you transition well so that you cross from the side you're on to the side that God wants you to be? And I felt like as I was praying over our, our services, that God was like, okay, Kurt, not only are people transitioning individually, but you're making a major transition with this church. Like, we're, we're, we're crossing over from one church in one location to one church in two locations. And so, so there's a transition that's happening corporately, but there's a lot of transition going on every day individually. And so God said, this is a moment that you got to pastor people. This is a moment you got to step in and you got to you got to help people to understand there's a good way to transition and a bad way. There's a way that will get you to the other side, and there's a way that will cause you to wander in circles and regret that you ever took a step in the first place. So I said, all right, God, I, I want to just know. And, and when you get to the book of Joshua, you, you begin to see Joshua walk out this transition and, and to do it very successfully, better than the first time they tried with Moses. And so, God, what do you want to say to us? And what do you want to show us is where I want to go. So I want us to look at this today so that we can all transition successfully here and that God can use us. All right. So let me just kind of help us get to Joshua chapter three so that you can just see a little bit of context here. Because there's some stages that happen in all of our lives before transition occurs. And so stage one is Joshua chapter one. Stage one is what I would call place of inspiration, okay? This is where God shows up to Joshua and says, Joshua, we're, we're gonna transition. I'm moving you, and, and here's what's gonna happen, all right? I, I'm gonna cross you over into the land. There's gonna be enemies there, but you're gonna defeat them. And, and so don't be, don't be uh, afraid. Be strong and courageous. 
I'm going to use you, and everywhere where your foot goes, I'm going to give you that land and that territory. Man, you talk about inspiration. It's when God shows up and tells you what the other side looks like. Tells you that he's with you on the other side. Tells you that you're going to do great things on the other side. I don't know about you, but that inspires me. When I want inspiration, I read Joshua chapter 1. Be strong. Be courageous. God's with you. You're going to crush enemies. You're going to lead the people. Your foot is going to place in soil that I'm going to give you as an inheritance. Man, I'm inspired. Stage two is a place of investigation. Because when you get to Joshua chapter two, now you start investigating what God inspired you with. How's this going to work? What does it look like on the other side? God, how are you going to do what I think is impossible? What are you going to do? And so what do we do? We start investigating. We start, we start trying to figure it out. This is where our human reasoning this is where our minds get involved. How, how's God going to do it? What's he going to do? What's he going to use? Who's he going to use? How, how's that? What's the time frame? When do we get to go? Oh, I mean, that's how my mind works. Like, it's, it's, it's always doing that. So they investigate. Now, Joshua learns a big lesson here because when Moses was trying to transition the people, Remember, he investigated too, and he sent out 12 spies. He said, go get to the other side, spy it out, and come back and tell me what it's like. And do you remember, out of the 12 spies, 10 of them came back and said, nope, and two of them said, yes. You talk about the odds there, uh, those aren't good odds. And so you know what I love about Joshua? Joshua goes, man, I'm not doing that again. So you know what? Joshua sends two spies. He's figuring the odds are better with two than with 12. And so he sends them to the other side, and they come back, and they're like, we can do this. We can do it. And so they're investigating. Can I just pause right here and say, here's what's going to help us transition successfully, is you've got to limit the circle of people around you and get people around you that will help you get from where you are to where you're going. Because not everybody's for you. Not everybody is people of faith. Not everybody's going to give you a good report and tell you, charge ahead, be strong, be courageous. And so you've got to limit the people that are in your circle. You've got, you, you got to be careful who you're camped out with. Remember, they're camped on one side, and they can see to the other side. And, and, and you can be around people that maybe can't see what you can see. Or maybe you're looking at the same thing, but you're seeing it by faith, and they're saying, seeing it through a whole different lens. And so you got to be careful who's around you and who you're listening to when you're transitioning, because that cost the people during that first transition with Moses a lot of time going in circles. And so all of a sudden, God says, we're ready to go. And he begins Joshua chapter 3 with a place of instruction, okay? Not inspiration, not investigation. Now he says, I'm gonna give you some instructions. So, so here's what you need to do to walk this out, Joshua. And God comes and gives him very specific instructions. So this is where I wanna camp for just a few minutes. And I wanna give you the instructions that God gave Joshua so that he could transition successfully and the people could transition successfully. And so it would help them be able to walk out this transition. So look at what he says here in verse 2, Joshua chapter 3. After three days, the officers went throughout the camp, giving orders to the people. So here come the instructions. When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the Levitical priest carrying it, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. Then you will know which way to go since you have never been this way before. But keep a distance of about 2,000 cubits between you and the ark. That's about 1,000 yards, all right? 10 football fields. Don't get closer than 10 football fields to that ark. Do not go near it, God said. So here's instruction number one. This is what God said to Joshua. See where God's presence is leading and follow it. He said, keep your eyes on the ark, and when you see the ark moving, you're to follow it. 
go where it goes. And so that was the instruction that Joshua gave to the people. He said, keep your eyes on the ark. Now, let me just stop right here and do a teaching for a minute because you might be new to the Bible. You might be sitting here going, what in the world is the Ark of the Covenant? Not, not Raiders of the Lost Ark or something like that, but you're thinking, what is, the, what is the Ark of the Covenant? Again, this is Old Testament. This is before Jesus is revealed and Jesus comes. And so the Ark of the Covenant represented God's presence to the people. It was symbolic. It was like God is in this box. God is this box. And so it was a box. It was 27 inches high, 27 inches wide, by 45 inches long, all right? So not a huge box made of acacia wood, but it was overlaid completely in gold. So acacia wood as its frame, gold overlaid with two cherubims, one on each end of the box with their wings that are going over their heads and touching at the top of this box. And then there were poles that went, one pole went on one side, one pole went on the other, so that four guys could carry it, holding the poles, and they could walk with it. And and that was symbolic to the people of God's presence. But I want you to know something. The Ark of the Covenant is a picture of Jesus. Jesus hadn't come yet, so God had to give him a symbol, that that one day, somebody's going to come that's not going to be a box, he's going to actually be a person, but this symbolizes who that person's going to be. So, so when you look at the Ark of the Covenant, you can see everything points to Jesus. Like the acacia wood represents his humanity. That's, that's materials. That's things that you and I have. But then the gold represents his divinity and his royalty. Isn't that a picture of Jesus? Jesus came in human flesh but he was wrapped in divinity. He was, he was divinity and he was humanity all wrapped up into one. And, and so here he is. And inside this box, God had said, you need to put three things. And Moses followed those instructions. There were three things in the box. All of them point to Jesus. The first was the tablets of stone that Moses wrote the law on. And those tablets were inside that box. And how many of you know Jesus came and said, you don't need written law on on tablets of stone anymore because I've come to fulfill the law. I'm the fulfillment of everything that was written down there. And so it points to Jesus. Aaron's bud, a budded rod was inside that box. When Moses was choosing who are going to be the priest, who is going to represent God to the people as Levitical priest? And so God said, have all the guys come, bring their staffs with them, throw them all down in a bundle, And when you come back the next day, whatever one is budded, that's the one you're to choose. And so sure enough, they throw all the rods down. Aaron's buds overnight. So then Moses goes, Aaron, you're the man. You're chosen by God. And what we know about Jesus is Jesus was chosen by God to be our high priest. He's the high priest that rules over all the priests. Jesus is that. And then the last thing was a jar of manna. All right, because while they were in the wilderness, God said, I'm going to take care of you and I'm going to provide bread for you. And so that manna represented the bread that they were given, and we know that Jesus came and said, you don't need manna, you don't need physical food, what you need is me. I'm the bread of life, and I am what can... So everything about that represented Jesus. So, so for you and I now, we got to translate that in the 21st century and go, what am I supposed to focus on? I'm supposed to focus on Jesus... And wherever Jesus is leading, I need to follow. Does that make sense? Like, whatever Jesus is up to, wherever I see him moving, I need to focus on it, and then I know I need to move with it. I need to engage with that. I need to do whatever is going on. That's what he's saying. Now, I don't know about you, but do you have a hard time focusing? Okay, some of you right now, your eyes are crisscrossed, all right? You're, you've had too much sun. You you soaked it all in because you didn't think it was coming back ever again. You're looking at me right now and you're like, no, 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 I'm fine, I'm fine. Life just can be that way, can it? Like you can get your eyes off on so many different things. You can get yourself focused on what you and I think we need to be doing to be moving. And and here's what happens, okay? One of two things happens. Either, Either you get anxious 
and frustrated about being in the place that you're in that you get ahead of God. You just start running out going, okay, if you're not moving, God, I'm going to go move. I'm going to go make something happen. Or you're so distracted and you're focused on the wrong thing that actually Jesus is doing stuff right in your midst or he's moving and you don't even know. You're not following anything. You're, you're just, you're oblivious to the fact, look what God is doing. And don't you want to engage in that? Don't you want to be there? And so, so he says to the people, he says, focus. Get your eyes on what Jesus is doing. How many of you know Jesus is doing stuff all the time? Like he's moving right now. He's going to move later today. He's going to move tomorrow. And he's going, what are you focused on? Do you see what I'm doing? And what I'm doing, go get involved in it. And so as we're following Jesus, we sense that Jesus was moving us. We sensed as we were praying, God opened up doors, and then all of a sudden God opens up doors, and then he brings an opportunity to us, and then we see God miraculously supply for it. And he says, now follow me. Now walk into this. And so we're following. As a church, we're saying, we're trusting you, Jesus, because we got our eyes focused on what's... I I love this because look at verse number four. He says, Here's why you need to keep your eyes on Jesus and follow him. Because he knows where he's going. And you haven't gone this way before. Like that's the the reason people don't transition is because they're afraid of the unknown. They're afraid of stepping into uncertainty. And so they stay in their comfortable little box and they say, I'm not moving. And and they stay there and they're frustrated and they hate it, but they don't want to move. And so, so what happens is, he, he comes and says, you can move. I'm, I'm moving, but you got to step out. And, and so follow my instructions. I don't know about you, but um, instructions, written instructions are difficult for me. Like written instructions, I would rather watch a video or someone else do it than I would rather read instructions. How many people out there identifying with me right now? Like just, like don't give me a bunch of Chinese on a paper somewhere with a bunch of you know, parts listed and all that. Tell me to put something together. Just get me to YouTube. I'll watch a video and I'll figure it out. Or, or sit someone down next to me that's doing it and I'll just look over and I'll just follow them and I can get it done. And so you know what I love about this? I love that there was the written part and I'm not saying the word's not important and I'm not saying don't digest this, but here's what he does. He not only gives us the written word, but then he says, now come on, I'm gonna walk out what I've told you. You just follow me. Is anyone else excited about that today? Anybody else glad that he doesn't just give you a book and just throw it at you and say, figure it out for yourself. But he says, I'm going to go before you. You just follow me. Just walk where I'm walking. And so we can walk it out. Now watch what happens, verse 5. So he comes back to him. And Joshua says, now tell the people, consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. Instruction number two. He says this separate yourself from the things that are holding you back. Instruction number two, Joshua goes, consecrate yourselves. The word consecrate means purify yourself. It was a ceremony that they would do before they would offer a sacrifice to God. They they would have to ceremonially purify themselves so that they had clean hands and a clean heart. They didn't have sin. They didn't have anything attached to them that was going to to hinder them bringing a sacrifice to God. So he went all throughout the camp and he said, okay guys, before you transition, before we cross over, you gotta cut yourself loose from everything that's holding you back. You gotta get rid of that stuff. How many of you know 39 years of wandering in the wilderness, you get a lot of stuff attached to you? All right, now if you don't think you have a lot of stuff, move. Okay, you'll figure out how much junk you have. You'll figure out how much stuff. You, you, you live out in the wilderness, you're going to get stuff that's going to get stuck to you and inside of you that isn't meant to go from one side to the other side. They had sin. They were involved in idolatry in the wilderness. They were doing things that were outside of the boundaries of Scripture. They had bad attitudes, complaining, criticizing, 
I mean, wanting to kill their leader and say, this guy doesn't know what he's doing. What'd you lead us out here for? They, they, they were having a difficult time being unified as a group. They had all kinds of issues going on in their life. And so Joshua says, listen, listen. We got to separate ourselves because what's on this side is not meant to go to the other side. And I can tell you one of the reasons that we have a hard time transitioning is because we're trying to cross over with all of our stuff. And God said, I never intended you to bring that season into this season. You can't bring that stuff that you experienced in that level to this level. Like, you got to leave some stuff behind. They had to leave stuff behind that was difficult to leave behind. Remember, their leader, Moses, isn't with them. Some of them, their parents, aren't with them. They died in the wilderness. And those are tough. But he says, listen, you can't get to where you're going if you're still reaching back, trying to bring stuff with you that wasn't meant for this season that you're in right now. And so you've got to walk through that transition. And so the people are like, okay, now think about this. They got to cross a river, okay? Do you ever think about crossing a river when you got your hands full of stuff? Not a good idea. And so they're like, how are we going to get all this stuff to the other side? And God's going, I don't want it on the other side. It was for that season. And aren't you glad that we learned some things? Listen, your past isn't meant to go into your future. Some of you, the reason you are having a hard time transitioning is because you're still living in your past. You're still living in your failure, your mistake. And God's going, you know what? That's going to stay in this season. Aren't you glad he let some stuff stay at the other side so that when you get to the other side, you get a brand new start. You get a fresh opportunity to say, God, this is a new opportunity for me to walk in. And so he says, okay, consecrate yourself. Get rid of it. Separate yourself. Like, go through the camp. Take a few days. And and listen, God's going to do some amazing things if we're willing to surrender these things and leave them behind. He's got new things that he's going to attach us to on the other side. So leave those things behind. And just do what God is telling us to do. The way of faith, listen, The way of faith is always in front of us. It's not behind us. He's not telling you to go. He's not telling you uh, to, 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 to try holding on to everything in life. He's saying the way in front, the way before in faith is in front of you. Don't look in the rear view mirror. Keep moving forward. That's a walk of faith, isn't it? It's not easy to do. He says, just walk it out. Now watch this. Ready? So then they get to verse number six. And he says, Joshua says to the priest. So here's the third instruction. You ready? He says, all right, take up the Ark of the Covenant now and pass ahead of the people. So they took it up and went ahead of them. And the Lord said to Joshua, today I will begin to exalt you in the eyes of Israel so that they may know that I'm with you as I was with Moses. Tell the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant, watch this, when you reach the edge of the Jordan waters, go and stand in the river. Now if you, you think that's easy to do, watch what verse 14 says. Jump down to verse 14. So when the people broke cramp to go across the Jordan, the priest carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. Now the Jordan is at flood stage during harvest. So this is a river that maybe once looked like this, but now looks like this because it's overflowing its banks. It's harvest season. Yet as soon as the priest who carried the Ark reached the Jordan, and their feet touched the water's edge. The water from upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a heap a great distance away. Final instruction, number three. Joshua says this. You got to step into what is between you. You have to step into what is between you. On one side, they're camped. 
They're headed to the other side where God wants them to be, but there's a Jordan River in between them. And God says, okay, you're gonna have to step into that river in order to get to the other side. Now, no easy task when it's just normal. I've been to the Jordan many a times now. I've been in the Jordan literally baptizing people in the Jordan. It's a dirty river. It's a river that can easily become swift and moving, especially during different seasons of the year. Not one that you would want to try to take small children and babies and all that and try to walk across, especially when it's totally overflowing. Like now, just in order to get to where the river is, you're stepping in mud and muck and water before you even get to the deeper part of the river. Watch this now. Watch this. In order to cross over or to transition, sometimes God says you've got to step into the thing that you're afraid of. You've got to step into the thing that you doubt you're actually going to get across. You got to actually take a step. Like you got to go put your foot in the water before God is going to do his part. I know sometimes we're sitting around and the reason people don't transition is because they're waiting for God to do something. And God goes, I'm not waiting for me, I'm waiting for you. I'm waiting for you to step into the thing that you're afraid of. Step into the thing that could take your own life. Step into the thing that you think is impossible. And when you step, notice, they, they walked into this thing. And can you imagine those priests going, you know what? We're, we're the first ones. And the moment they stepped in there, whoo, just like they saw with Moses in the Red Sea, the waters, whoo, they stopped. And, the, and the, the priests went out there and they stood in the middle. And then the people walked across. Now, I don't know about you, but it still takes faith to even walk across. Because I'd be walking across looking at that wall of water going... And then when I got close to the edge, I'd be like, <laughs> to the other side. And then I'd be looking back, come on, come on, because that water is just held up. And so even with the instruction God gives us, we still need faith, don't we? We're still looking at that thing going, is this going to work? I've been in those moments in my own life where God is to telling me to step out. I'm in that moment right now where I'm stepping out. And I'm going, God, are you there? Are you sure? God, is this really going to work? God, I, I'm, I, I, this thing can consume us and cost me my life. And God says, I got you. You're all right. Just, just walk. And we just got to walk across. We got to walk across in faith. And I love it because the very thing that's meant to keep you is the very thing that God will allow you to walk over top of, to cross you over to the other side. Because that's where he wants you to be. That's the destiny and the purpose for your life. And so they're camped out, and God shows up and says, Joshua, I'm going to give you some instructions, and I need you to tell the people. And when I give those instructions, you've got two choices. Either you can just listen to them and not do anything, or you can walk this out. But if you'll walk this out, you will do something that no generation before you has ever done. You're actually going to walk into the land that I have for you. And so church, we're in that place right now where God is speaking to us through his word. Individually, he's speaking to us as a church. He's going, you got to keep your eyes focused on me. And listen, if I move, don't be afraid to move with me. See where God is moving and what he's up to and don't be afraid. Don't, don't be a spectator. Like right now is not the time for you to be sitting in the seat going, I'm just going to sit back and see whether this works or not. If it works, I'm in. If it doesn't, I'll tell him, I told you so. No, he's going, no, 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 no. No, we need you. You got to get all in on this. I had one of those moments this week when we were just looking at volunteers of trying to fill locations and leaders who were sitting in a room with me and saying, I, I'm, we don't have enough right now. 
and the deadline is come. We don't, we, don't, we don't have everybody in this church engaged, walking with us in this journey and allowing God to use them. Are you sure? I'm at, are, are we sure? Everyone's got to step in and go, yeah, I'm in there. I'm engaged. And God, if you're moving and you want to use, you want to, you want to do something. Some of you, I'm, you're going to step out into something that you thought you could never do, and God's going to show you, see, I've been wanting to do this through you and in you. And then separate yourself. You know, there's things that are holding people back. I hear it all the time. I see it as a pastor. Man, if they could just cut that loose, they can step into it. Or you got to actually take a step of faith. And you got to say, okay, God, I'm scared to death. I'm being courageous like you told me to be courageous. So here it goes. And you got to get into it ankle deep. And you got to keep walking until you get into it waist deep. And you got to keep trusting until you see God make a way. Because he knows where he's going and you and I don't. He's already into tomorrow. We're still living in today. So you can trust him. He knows what he's doing. He knows where he's going. But he's saying, are you coming with me? Or are you going to stay on the other side? You're going to stay on your side, or you want to cross over to the other side? Would you stand with me? That's the question today. That's the question that you and I have in our life is this, is, is are you frustrated enough at the level that you're at? Are you tired of going around in circles? And listen, the wilderness is not God's plan for you, but he'll use the wilderness to teach us trust and dependence. So even if you're in a wilderness, I've been in the wilderness before, and I couldn't wait to get out of it because I knew it wasn't God's destiny for me. But I had to go through it to get to the other side. Some of you, you're thinking of that obstacle right now that is causing you the most fear and the most uncertainty, and you're already rationalizing it. Like, I can read your mind right now. You're, okay, Kurt, what about this, and what about that? And if this doesn't work, do you understand what this is going to do? And I'm going to, I understand. I, I'm there with you. But that's why he says, but you got to step. Step always involves faith. And so you got to take that step. And you got to trust. And so I want us just to, before we close, all right, I want us just to, to stay at this moment because I really believe this is so strategic that if you go a little off here, it costs you big in the transition that God wants to do. So we really need to get the mind of God. We got to hear what God is saying. So worship teams is going to sing just a, a quick song that we just sung that just solidifies what we said. And I just want you to say, God, you're speaking. You're speaking to me. You're speaking to us as a church. God, I'm hearing you. Now, what do, you, what do I need to do? God, give me instruction so that I don't turn right or left and miss this thing and go around in circles. God, what are you saying for my faith and what step do you want me to take? And then God's gonna speak to us, all right? Are you ready? Are you ready? Let's do it. In Jesus' name.